Uh, my name is Dr. Patrick Bratton. I'm the director of the South Asia Regional Studies Program here at, um, at the Army War College. Uh, we are pleased today to have a very important guest, Dr. Chris Snedden from the Daniel K. Inouye Center for Asia Pacific Security Studies, all the way in my former home state of Hawaii. Wade, Captain Turvold, Max, future home state again. Uh, he is a world uh, internationally renowned known uh, specialist in Jammu and Kashmir and South Asia in general, a uh, long history uh, in the region, both doing field work, research, teaching, advising policymakers uh, as well. He's got, I think, one of the best books about the Kashmir conflict uh, that's available that, that you can look at, well worth your time in looking. And so he's gonna talk to you guys today about the importance of the Kashmir conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Um, no money was passed, uh, no money passed hands in order for the endorsement from Patrick. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, I have to say I am reminded of Kashmir coming into Carlisle because of all of the snow and the, the trees without their leaves. Being an Australian, uh, we used to, our summer is the total reverse of yours. So when it's winter here, it's summer in Australia and vice versa. So our summer holidays, is when I used to get my period of time away from teaching so I could go and do research. And that meant I was going into the snows of Kashmir. And flying into Kashmir uh, was very reminiscent of flying into Carlisle yesterday. Uh, first thing I have to tell you is that these are my views. I do work for the US Department of Defense, but these views do not reflect the Department of Defense's views on neither Australia or US Department of Defense, nor the Indian government, nor importantly, the Pakistan government. So, they're just my views. And herein lies the problem with this dispute. If you see on that photo on the right, it says paradise on earth. That is why the Kashmir dispute is the Kashmir dispute, because this area called the Kashmir Valley, from which the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir takes its popular name of Kashmir, is considered by some to be one of the most beautiful places on earth. It is very beautiful, but because of that reputation, it's desired, and it's desired by both India and Pakistan. There's a third element, the people, who are to some extent, to a large extent, sidelined from the actual dispute. But um, I like this picture on the left because it gives you a hint. It's an old picture. You won't see horse-drawn vehicles there very much now, if at all. But it gives you a hint of the beauty. So, it's, so you can, in the distance, see some mountains. It's this massive valley surrounded by mountains. So that's just the Kashmir Valley part of it. I'll tell you about some of the other regions in due course. Uh, that's really what I'm going to try and cover today, um, fairly quickly. Uh, it is a, an, a long dispute, arguably one of the longest post-war disputes, depending on when you think Palestine started. Palestine and Pakistan are about the same age. I do need to give you some history. Now. The good old British, any British in the audience, I don't think we do, do we? So this is great. Australians have a very difficult relationship with the British. We, uh, we are a product of the British, no doubt. My forebears were all British, but we love to beat them in sport. And as an Australian, it's great to harangue them. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, but during the, the British period, that's the British Empire. The pink bits were the areas that the British ruled directly. The yellow bits were the, rule, the bits that they ruled indirectly through princes, rulers, local rulers, usually rajas, which means ruler, maha, raja, great ruler, nawabs, there was a nizam down south who was a Muslim. Uh, this is 1909, so that area on the far right that is now Myanmar, which is also called Burma, was still part of the British Indian Empire until 1939. But Jammu and Kashmir, that area up there, was considered to be the crown, and it was also important for all of those regions. It was the largest princely state in the Indian Empire, the British Indian Empire. It was also very wealthy and had this prestige because of this Kashmir Valley area. So the, the state was called Jammu and Kashmir, and the shorthand was not Jammu, even though the ruler came from Jammu, it was Kashmir because of the wealth, the prestige, the history of this Kashmir Valley area. And significantly, it had international borders. Unlike all other princely states, some princely states had one border. Jammu and Kashmir had two borders with other states. It had borders with Xinjiang and Tibet, which ended up being part of China. In 1947, their status was uh, unsettled because the communists hadn't taken over in China yet. From about 1950, they're clearly part of China. 
It also had borders with Afghanistan, uh, very close to that Wakhan salient that divided the two empires, the British Indian Empire and the old Russian Empire, which by 1947 had become the Soviet Union, of course, which added to uh, Jammu and Kashmir's strategic significance because in those days it was the great game, the game between the British and the Russians for control of Central Asia, then later when the, the Russian Empire ended between the British and the Soviet Union, not the game, but the, the British were certainly concerned about the expansion of the Soviet Union. And J uh, Jammu and Kashmir was part of that game. It also had borders, as it turned out, with both Pakistan and India. So it was regionally significant. <clears throat> In 1947, though, it was politically disunified. The local ruler, and that's this gentleman there with the hat, he was a major general in the British Indian Army. He wasn't a frontline infantryman. He was a man who they used on occasions for various reasons to shore up their regime. But he was the ruler, and he was an autocrat, and he was the one who had to take the decision as to whether the princely state would join either India or Pakistan. The Indian Independence Acts was a little bit vague for princely states. Ostensibly, they became independent, but the British and the rulers of India and Pakistan had made it clear that they weren't going to have relations with anybody in, in terms of that nation, that entity being independent. So the rulers had to decide whether they wanted to join India or Pakistan. Most of them joined India because they were geographically within India, this fellow um, wanted to be independent, and he was independent for a period of time from the 15th of August 1947 until he finally joined India on the 26th of October. But he was a reluctant independentist. Uh, he didn't strive to become independent. He didn't develop a foreign service. He didn't develop his own military that could defend the borders and so on and so forth. He was a de facto independent entity because he was a vacill vacillator and he couldn't make up his mind whether he wanted to join India or Pakistan. Pakistan would have been the logical choice because 77% of his population was Muslim, but the 20% that were Hindu were very strongly Hindu, and it wasn't that simple. Um, some of his population, some of his Muslim population, were actually secular, and that fellow on the right, Sheikh Abdullah, is a Kashmiri leader, a very popular, arguably the most popular, leader of the Kashmiri Muslims. And by Kashmiri, I mean the people in the Kashmir Valley. The, pe the Muslims in Jammu, some of them were very strongly pro-Pakistan and one or two favoured India. But the people in the valley, when it came to the choice of India or Pakistan, actually said, we want to join India. Even though Pakistan's been set up as a homeland for Muslims, that's not sufficient reason. We think our identity will be stronger by remaining with India and also, uh, Sheikh Abdullah didn't get along with Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the first ruler of Pakistan, the governor general, the guy really responsible for the creation of Pakistan. They clashed. And um, he and Abdullah and Nehru were what in Australia we would call mates. They were very close friends. And they had similar ideologies. So it wasn't a simple decision for Hari Singh, the Maharaja. He knew all of these things. Significantly, the main economic links were with Pakistan, and I've got Pakistan in red because Pakistan is a made-up word. It has two meanings, land of the pure in um, Persian, um, Urdu, uh, but it also is a combination of letters that represent things, P for Punjab, A for Afghania, by which the, they envisaged, these people who created Pakistan, the northwest frontier province of India, um, where these Pakhtuns, these Afghans, as they're also called, lived. K stood for Kashmir, by which they meant the former princely state, or the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. They, were hope they the Pakistanis, were hoping to obtain all of that. I didn't stand for any anything. S stood for Sindh, the province around Karachi, and Tan was short for Baluchistan. Interestingly, no B for Bengal, even though East Pakistan came into being in 1947 as well. It ended up being Bangladesh in 1971. So... A made-up word, Pakistan also hoped to gain Jammu and Kashmir because the largest irrigation area in the world, which eventually was partitioned between India and Pakistan, was along the Indus River. And the waters flowing into that came through Jammu and Kashmir. So it, it had a whole heap of reasons. But the but is, Hari Singh was a Hindu and he didn't want to join Islamic Pakistan, Muslim Pakistan. 
Sheikh Abdullah was a secular person. He didn't believe in the power of religion. And Nehru, whose forebears had come from the Kashmir Valley, he was what is called a Hindu pundit, had this emotional link with Jammu and Kashmir and wanted it to come to India, part, certainly the Kashmir part of it, for that reason as well. So there's a few complexities there in 1947. Uh, these, these are various dates that I put up there to explain what happened in 1947. The red ones are not contested. Most of the other ones can be contested. So it's even on the 26th of October when the Maharaja finally decided to join India, the Pakistanis will tell you, oh, but he didn't sign the... There's no instrument of accession where he signed it. It doesn't really matter. His intention by that stage was that his princely state would join India. Various things happened along the way. There was a local uh, pro-Pakistan uprising by people in Punch, uh, which is an area to the west of, of um, the princely state, the southwest. But the big turning point was on the 22nd of October when these people from Pakistan invaded. The Maharaja said to India, help, my state's been invaded, I need some help to defend it. And the Indians said, we'll give you the help, but you need to sign on to to join your state with India, which he did. The next day, the Indians started to have troops arrive on the 27th in Srinagar, the summer capital of Jammu and Kashmir. There's also a winter capital between which the Dorabar, the administration, moves and still moves. It's, it's a crazy setup, but that's the way they've got it. Um, and on the 27th of October, India got a foothold and eventually moved on from that and pushed out these pro-Pakistan forces, which included the Pakhtuns, but also Muslims from Punch and various other folk who'd come in to try and capture the state for Pakistan. On the, in May 1948, the Pakistan army officially entered. It had been there, not in any large numbers, some, there'd been Pakistanis on leave who'd gone home uh, to, to fight, or some others who'd volunteered to go there, but certainly they officially entered in March Sorry, in May 1948. So when you talk about war between India and Pakistan, there was no war between India and Pakistan until that period of time. So the first war between India and Pakistan, their forces, was 1948. Up until then, India was fighting pro-Pakistanis. And certainly on the 1st of January 1949, there was a UN ceasefire. And uh, fighting ended. I was going to say peace was restored. Fighting ended is a better way of putting it. So now the current situation is that there's seven particular regions within Jammu and Kashmir. Now, India claims all of this entity. This map in India is not terribly popular because it shows the on-the-ground situation. Um, up until a high court decision recently, you had to show all maps in India as Jammu and Kashmir being part of India unequivocally. And if you didn't, you could be sent to jail, uh, charged with sedition and sent to jail. Thankfully, they've moved on. They're prepared to tolerate a little bit of difference. But this is the situation on the ground. India controls three regions, the Kashmir Valley, the Jammu region, and the Ladakh region. Now, Jammu and Ladakh are very pro-Indian. The Kashmir Valley is not so certain, and I'll talk more about that. P Pakistan administers, and the terminology is important, administers two regions, the Gilgit Baltistan area in the north and the Azad Kashmir area, that AK area. It administers it until the UN plebiscite is held to determine whether Jammu and Kashmir in its entirety will become either part of India or Pakistan. Now, when the Maharaja acceded to India, India said, we accept the accession. However, we want it affirmed by a popular, a reference to the people it was called. It's since been called a plebiscite. And uh, that was stated by the Governor General, Mountbatten, and also by Prime Minister Nehru. The UN came in when India took it to the UN at the end of 1947. They came in and investigated and reaffirmed that a plebiscite should be held. It's never been held because the, the resolutions talk about Pakistan and all Pakistani forces leaving Jammu and Kashmir. Then India moving most of its forces, but not all of its forces, out with the rest of those forces that remain spreading out throughout the, the princely state, the former princely state, to maintain law and order while the plebiscite's been, been conducted. Pakistan could never bring itself to withdraw its forces, chiefly because it didn't trust India. And that's been part of the problem. And the Pakistanis have used this as a stick to beat democratic India with. You, the great democracy India, won't hold a plebiscite. 
you should adhere to these UN resolutions. On the other hand, sometimes while they've been doing it, this Pakistan's been under military rule. So there's a few double standards and that's one of them. Um, and then China holds two areas as well. One area that was ceded to Pakistan in 1963, the CTC area, ceded to Pakistan. Um, India objected to that. They say you've given away land. Arguably, China very generously actually gave some land. And Aksai Chin. Now, when the, the Maharaja's forebear, who created in conjunction with the British general in Kashmir in 1846, he had some expeditionary forces that went up to these areas beforehand in the late uh, 1830s, early 1840s, and planted the flag and said, this is now Jammu and Kashmir territory. The way the British and the French and the Portuguese went around the world putting their flag and saying this is British territory or whatever it was, same thing. They didn't ever settle it. And as far as I can work out, Aksai Chin is still not settled by anybody. It's really difficult terrain. But India claims it. So there's seven regions. The area is about 84,000 square kilometres. Um, so <clears throat> that's all of Jammu and Kashmir. Nevada, for example, is 109. So it's not as big as that, but it's fairly big. Now, there's a few things that I'd like you to note about this particular area, which relate to the importance of the dispute. It is named after the famed Kashmir Valley, as I've suggested. So that creates problems, though, because when India is talking about Kashmir, they're usually talking about that region called the Kashmir Valley. When Pakistan's talking about Kashmir, they're usually talking about all of the former princely states. So sometimes when they're talking to each other, they're actually talking past each other. And a Kashmiri for an Indian would be an ethnic Kashmiri for the, from the Kashmir Valley. A Kashmiri for a Pakistani would be somebody from the former princely state the popular name for which was Kashmir. But this is really the area of contestation. It's the area both nations want. Ka the Pakistanis aren't really interested in Jammu or Ladakh. Hindu dominated Jammu, Buddhist dominated Ladakh, and also there's a Shia minority which isn't pro-Pakistani. Uh, they're really interested in the Kashmir Valley, and that's part of the area, the, the challenge. Uh, the significance of the building on the right, does anybody know? 9-11, first terrorist attack after 9-11 was where? I'm giving it away, really. It was the attack on the Jammu and Kashmir Legislative Assembly. So in, if you remember, the Jaishi Mohammed um, terrorists attacked the Indian parliament, which was very significant. India and Pakistan almost went to war as a result of that. But before that, in October, there was this attack by Jaishi Mohammed against the uh, Jammu and Kashmir Legislative Assembly in Srinagar, the first terrorist incident after 9-11. And this shows you some of the, the tourism. There's always been a lot of people go to the Kashmir Valley. And one of the reasons why it became popular was Jahangir, the uh, fourth Mughal emperor, loved Kashmir. And he built pleasure gardens and he went there six or eight times during his lifetime. On his deathbed, somebody said to him, is there anything you would like, O oh great Mughal? And he said, only oh, Kashmir. And as a result of that and various other things, it became very popular. Even in 1946, just before the British left, 20,000 Britishers, as they're called in the subcontinent, stayed as guests in the Kashmir Valley. Why? Yes, it's very beautiful. In summertime, when it's four, oh, sorry, um, Celsius, when it's 110 degrees in India on the plains, it's about 80, 85 in the Kashmir Valley, very pleasant, like Hawaii, you know. How many of you have been to Hawaii? Yes, yeah, very pleasant, you know, nothing like here, very mild. <laughs> we're, we're having winter in Hawaii and it's about 75 degrees at the coolest. Yes, yeah, very tolerable. So it was a very popular place. And these houseboats are significant because there is a special act that says if you want to buy land, you have to be what is called a state subject and you have to be able to confirm that. So only people in Jammu and Kashmir can buy land. Anybody else from India cannot buy land in that area and that's an issue at the moment as well. There's an article in the Indian Constitution, Article 35A, that recognises that and some people in the right of the Hindu uh, BJP-led government are saying we need to get rid of that. It's unfair, it's discriminatory and it's, it's causing problems. And those houseboats, you could actually buy 
movable property, but you could not buy immovable property. Hence those houseboats, they could be moved. And some of the Britishers did buy them. But they were also one of the places where people um, spent time while holidaying. So I've mentioned the different meanings between India and Pakistan, and that's the area that we're talking about, the Kashmir Valley, the area of contestation. It's about 16,000 square kilometres, 6,200 square miles. Now, Hawaii, the island territories, are about the same size, 6,400 square miles. Delaware is 1,949, so it's about three times the size of Delaware, not as big as New Jersey, bigger than Connecticut. Does that all make sense to you? Yeah. I don't know any of, the, where the, any of those places are. They're somewhere in the United States. So, yeah. Um, and the, terms, the terminology is interesting because India calls the part that Pakistan administers, Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So they've come in militarily and captured these areas, or there's been local uprisings that said we want to join Pakistan. On the other hand, the Pakistanis call what India controls IHK, Indian held, Kashmir or IOK, Indian Occupied Kashmir. So when you're looking at a map or you're reading a document and it talks about POK or IOK, you've got a fair idea who's written that document. They're either Indians or Pakistanis. Then there's COK as well, COK, which is China Occupied Kashmir. That's an Indian term. So depending on who you are and where you sit, uh, depends on who's occupying. Another thing is the maps. Now, India and Pakistan only agree on one thing in the Kashmir dispute. I shall tell you that shortly. But that's an Indian map. And you know it's an Indian map because it shows all of Jammu and Kashmir as being part of India. That's a Pakistani map. And you know it's a Pakistani map because it shows the Gilgit Agency, which was one of the areas that the British administered directly, sorry, indirectly, on behalf of the Maharaja, and they administered it. And they did it because of the strategic significance of the northern borders and the, the British concern about the Russians and then later the Soviets. And so Pakistan says this is not part of the dispute because the British administered it. The British did administer it, but on the 1st of August 1947, very publicly, they gave it back to the Maharaja. And it's always shown in the censuses as being part of the Maharaja's territory. So it's the, the Pakistanis, I think, trying to be a little bit clever with terminology or, if you like, it's a form of that wonderful thing that's called cartographical aggression. You know, assert your case through a map. And there are two examples thereof. The only thing that India and Pakistan do agree on, in my whole looking at this dispute since I started in 1984, the first brief I ever gave as an intelligence analyst was on an aspect of the Kashmir dispute. The only thing that they agree on is that neither Jammu and Kashmir nor any part of it can become independent. The problem with that is that many of the people in the Kashmir Valley, it seems, and there has been some polling to support this, and certainly those Kashmiris I've spoken to, ethnic Kashmiris, want independence. They don't want their state to be part of either India or Pakistan. Um, and there's various reasons for that. But it's going to be very difficult if the two nations that you're dealing with don't actually believe that you should be independent. So, there, this is part of the conundrum of trying to find a resolution to this particular area. There's been various changes to the dispute. Now, as far as I can see, it's now an imagined entity. You all know Benedict Anderson's concept of imagined communities. We imagine that we are... The United States... How many of you have been to the 50 states of the United States? I haven't met many people who have. I've met one who's been to 48 but there's a couple that have escaped her. So we imagine the United States as an entity. And yes, we, we can define it and we can measure it and we know there's 50 states and there's various this, that and the other, but it is an imagined entity. Jammu and Kashmir is never likely to be reunified and is definitely now only an imagined entity at very best. It's, it's going to... The issue is now how to divide it and that's part of the challenge. So. Since the mid-50s, India and Pakistan have been prepared to divide this entity, the challenge being where. So in 1947, it was which, which nation was going to possess Jammu and Kashmir in its entirety. Since the 1950s, it's been how are we going to divide it up? And that's been part of the challenge. So that's, that's one of the major challenges. 
And the stances are as follows. India's hard line stance, even though they're prepared to divide it is, their hard line stance is because the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir acceded to us on the 26th of October 1947, all of Jammu and Kashmir is part of India. It is an integral part of India. That's the language that they use. Their pragmatic stance is to make the LOC, the line of control, that is the old ceasefire line that came into being in 1949 when the ceasefire ended and became the line of control after the 1971 war when they made some adjustments to it to make it a little bit more policeable. Let's make that the border. That's okay, but there's a problem with that because the line of control is not extended right up to the China border. There's an area in between called Siachen Glacier, and I'll show you that in a minute. Pakistan, and it's important to note, Pakistan does not actually claim Jammu and Kashmir. Its stance is that the UN plebiscite should be held so the people can determine which way they want to, whether they want to join Pakistan or India. Very democratic, very wonderful. Um, but the problem is that plebiscite is never likely to be held. And India's made that clear for a long period of time. It's not interested in the plebiscite. So it's just Pakistan really using a stick to, to beat, to some extent or another, democratic India. There was a period of time when they engaged in serious negotiations. And that's General Musharraf on the left and Dr Manmohan Singh on the right, who had a series of uh, meetings and apparently got really close to resolving this issue. And they were going to make the line of control basically meaningless, there'd be no changes to the borders, people could come and go, they were going to demilitarise it. It being the problem, it wasn't clear what it was. Because of that map of Gilgit, was Pakistan also going to demilitarise that? And so on and so forth. But Musharraf unfortunately fell out of favour and disappeared from the scene and it was uncertain that Dr Manmohan Singh, who was leading a coalition government, had actually the political power to deliver as well. But they did negotiate for a period of time. The, the uh, resolution attempts have been many and varied. They tried war and that hasn't worked and it is not likely to work again. M India cannot militarily push Pakistan out, nor the other way around. Uh, the United Nations has been involved, but they haven't looked at the dispute since 1965. And they were unable to get their plebiscite held uh, for various reasons. And there's been bilateral talks, serious bilateral talks between India and Pakistan over the, over the years and um, none of them have succeeded. After the 1971 war when India convincingly beat Pakistan and as a result of which Bangladesh came into being, they concluded the Simla Agreement and the Simla Agreement said basically all issues between India and Pakistan now are bilateral issues. There will be no third party involvement. No United Nations, no uh, mediators, uh, assistance from anybody else. And India consistently adheres to that stance. So when you see presidential candidates or politicians around the world saying, happy to go in and negotiate and be a mediator on the Kashmir dispute, all they're doing is they're sticking a, their finger into India's chest and India says, no, no, it's not. It's not your dispute, it's a bilateral issue. So you're just irking India. Since 1988, there's been an, a serious anti-India uprising in the Kashmir Valley. And they, the people want Azadi, which is a very difficult term to translate. It can mean all sorts of things. I've seen it translated as freedom or independence. I've seen it translated as also joining Pakistan and also autonomy and various things in between. Essentially, it means independence. And it seems that there's a, a fair degree of support for that. But as I mentioned earlier, India and Pakistan are not in favour of that at all. But it's the Kashmiris saying, we want something apart from what else has been proposed. And that's a real problem. Post 9-11, Musharraf and Singh had those talks, as I mentioned. Right now, there's almost nothing happening between India and Pakistan. India is trying to ignore Pakistan. It's hoping it will go away, I think. Uh, the Pakistanis are trying to engage with India, but not terribly successfully. And that's part of the problem. They just aren't talking. Uh, the problem is compounded because next year... In, uh, sorry, next year. It's this year, isn't it? Yes, we're already... Next year has come. 2019, India and Pakistan are having another... Sorry, not India and Pakistan. India is having a general election. 
Pakistan had an election last year and we know that the cricket has taken over in Pakistan with the... Sorry, you guys don't get cricket, do you? Anybody here play cricket? Huh? <laughs> What's cricket? <laughs> play what? I played one. Did you? Yeah. How'd you go? Uh, lost pretty badly against the Brits. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yes. Uh, so anyway, India's, India's going to be in sort of lockdown mode. It's not going to be doing anything significant in foreign policy until midway through the year when they have the government uh, worked out. It seems the BJP may get in again, but Patrick will be able to keep you informed as to what's happening with that election. Very significant, 750 people, 50 million people in the uh, are going to vote, so it's, it's very significant. The, I've got this photo up here. Have you seen the Wagga border closing ceremony? It's this crazy thing that India do every night and apparently have been doing since around September 1947. It's the best example of India-Pakistan cooperation that exists because these men do it in a choreographed way. They both do the same things at the same time. And the other thing is they've all got incredibly bad backs because they lift their leg up here and then smash it into the ground. I've been very even-handed. I've seen it from both sides. The Pakistan side, they divide the crowd into men and women and they, they shout Pakistan Zindabad, long live Pakistan. The Indian side is just like India, all chaotic men and women mixed up together and so on and so forth. And they shout Bharat Mata Ki Jai, long live India, basically, and so on and so forth. But at the moment, very little is happening. In fact, they're not really talking both nations. So these are some of the things that's needed to resolve the dispute. There's a serious trust deficit. Uh, what we mean by that is India and Pakistan do not trust each other. As populations, they don't necessarily dislike each other, but they certainly don't tr uh, trust each other. And their militaries do not trust each other. There's a whole uh, raft of things that they can point to where one has done the dirty on the other. In other words, been underhanded, engaged in subterfuge, or whatever it might be. And that is a serious problem. Um, the other thing that is needed is what I call compelling constituencies. There's no movements in either nation to say, this is crazy. You've got to resolve this dispute. There's no... Uh, how many of you are old enough to remember the Vietnam War and the protests? And Australia was also involved in the Vietnam War. Wherever you go, we go. So we... And we've actually done one more than you. You didn't do the Malaya insurgency. We did, so... Big tick for us. Australia and, and the United States have been fighting together since 1917, by the way, during World War I, when some of your troops got a presidential dispensation to fight under the command of an Australian general. Usually it's the other way around now. You guys command and we, we, we say yes, sir. But we've been fighting together for a long period of time. But during the Vietnam War, there were people on the street saying, this has got to stop. And eventually governments listen to that. There's nothing like that in India or Pakistan saying, this is crazy. You need to resolve this. And I, until that happens, there's not going to be any resolution to the dispute. And the third thing is visionary and politically powerful leaders. So Manmohan Singh may have had the vision, but he didn't have the political power. Musharraf had the power because he was both chief of the army, which is the most powerful force in Pakistan, and he was also the president. But you, you need the combination on both sides at the same time. It's never been there, and at the moment it doesn't look like it's going to be there either. Imran Khan might like to try and resolve the issue. He's still in his honeymoon period. So in about 18 months, two years, Imran Khan will start to go down in his popularity, as Mr Modi has also gone down. And it's not a, a, a certainty that the BJP are going to win the next, next election. Uh, political leaders eventually become unpopular. What would be helpful if they could sign, find something in common, like find some oil in the middle of Kashmir and develop it as a joint project? Highly unlikely. Or mediation or a third party. Now, India is not interested in that, but their very successful Indus Waters Treaty Agreement, which shares the waters of the... Indus River and the five other ri rivers of Punjab. Punjab means five waters, Punj five, Arb waters, was negotiated in conjunction with the World Bank. And that continues to work pretty successfully, that agreement. Same with the United Nations, who brokered the ceasefire in 1949. So there is um, historical evidence that third parties can actually help this dispute. But India is not interested. Pakistan would be, depending on who was offering, 
uh, to mediate uh, would be interested. China offered to mediate and Pakistan said, yeah, that'd be great. And India said, no, I don't think so. One, we don't want a third party and certainly not China. So uh, this is now getting onto the meat of why it's, why it's important. It's a serious ongoing flashpoint between India and Pakistan. And there are some Kashmiris who believe that India and Pakistan could find, fight a nice little nuclear war in this nice little amphitheater called the Kashmir Valley. I am not a nuclear person, I don't know, but it is a perception that some Kashmiris have. So they have fought in 1948, 1965, and again 1999 when the car, you may remember Kargil, which was significant because it took place about 12 months after they had confirmed their nuclear capabilities through a series of nuclear tests. There was also fighting there in 1971, but it wasn't about Jammu and Kashmir. 1971 was when Bangladesh came into being. They both deploy huge and active military forces along the line of control. India also has large paramilitary forces controlling this insurgency in the Kashmir Valley. Um, and I say active because they are now regularly firing across the line of control. Artillery, barrages, small arms, and now we're seeing sniper fire as well. And we're seeing people taken out by snipers on both sides. And that's a significant development as well. And as I say, it's a flashpoint. So it's important for that reason. It's also important because it's distracted a lot of resources from national development. Now, India and Pakistan are both developing nations. The official poverty rate in India is still 21%. So one in five Indians are still living below the official poverty line. The poverty rates are more likely to be 40, 50% of Indians who are poor and who are struggling. This dispute itself has cost them a lot in both emotions and finance. And now they're fighting on this area, Siachen Glacier, way up there. And you can see just to the left of the, the point of that arrow is where the line of control ends. So if India wanted to make the line of control into the international border, they still have to negotiate the bit between the end of that line of control and the China border. And given the difficulties Indians and Pakistanis have on agreeing in anything, that would add a further layer of complexity. But the, um, this is what this, this fighting on the Siachen Glacier involves. 22,000 feet above sea level, I, very, I met a proud Indian who actually said to me in New Delhi recently at a terrorist uh, workshop that my colleague, Dr. Chris Harmon, had helped organise. Uh, I I've, I've, was at the highest point on Siachen Glacier. That was 27,000 feet above sea level. And he was very proud. He and a colleague served there, defending Indian territory from the Pakistanis. I went to Ladakh last year, which was about 12,000 feet above sea level. And that I found personally debilitating. You know, it's much higher altitude. You have to slow down. And I walked up to the village, which was about a kilometre away, and I had to pause twice because I cannot imagine what it's like 22 or even 27,000 feet above sea level. And most of the people who die up there don't die from fighting. In fact, very few people die from fighting. It's avalanche, it's over, it's exposure from the weather and those altitude sickness. And it's just crazy. It's costing each around $300 million per annum. That's a lot of money to spend on something that is really quite spurious when you're a developing nation. But it's to do with pride. And it's also to do with it's mine and you can't have it. It's that sort of mentality. The third one is there's this concept of do not give a square inch of territory to your enemy, the enemy being either Pakistan or India. So they're fighting on this glacier. And it's just, from my point of view, crazy. It's, India justifies it because of China being nearby. And they don't, there's a very serious pass uh, called the um, Karakoram Pass, which would, in theory, allow China to access Pakistan. There's also a pass up north called the Kunjarab Pass, which the Karakoram Highway runs down. And that's the one that eventually will, that goes to Gwadar, the, the port on the Indian Ocean. So yes, there's some strategic significance. But apart from that, it's just, in my opinion, futile. So the dispute is also important because of this uprising in the anti, uh, this anti-India uprising in the Kashmir Valley. The, the fact that the dispute is not resolved fuels various people's ideas and desires, including these Kashmiris. And they're now anti-India. They're not necessarily pro-Pakistan, but they're, large segments of them are really seriously disenchanted with India. 
It also gives Pakistan a place to meddle and cause India problems. Pakistan talks about death by a thousand cuts. Wherever we can, we will cause problems to, to India. And one of the places they do it is the Kashmir Valley, and they use proxies. Lashkar e Toiba, who you may have heard of, and also Jaish e Mohammed, and the third one is the Hezbollah Mujahideen, which is a local force, but Pakistan helps them as well. And they're the ones that India is dealing with. There's also serious human rights um, disputes, and I say unaccountable because there are special acts of parliament, like India's Disturbed Area Under Armed Forces, Special Powers Act 1990, Public Safety Act 1978, which is a local Jammu and Kashmir one, India's Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Prevention Act 1985, and India's Prevention of Terrorism Act 2002, which essentially mean that the, the Pakistan, sorry, the Indian paramilitary and the military forces are beyond regular scrutiny. And there have been human rights abuses. No Indian soldier, as far as I can work out, has ever been convicted of any human rights abuse. And there have been rapes, and there's been people disappeared, and those sorts of things, and they haven't been held accountable. So from that point of view, it's rather serious. Um, and this is the challenge now, too, that the youth of Kashmir are seriously disenchanted. And India, it seems, don't know what what, how to resolve that particular issue, what to do with it. Now, I've got on, on the right here, human shield acceptable. So one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that the paramilitary did one day was to get this Kashmiri. They were being attacked by Kashmiris. So they got a Kashmiri, whacked him on the front of the, the jeep and tied him down and put a sign and said, uh, if he gets shot, you're in trouble. Was that acceptable? Uh, most commentators said no. However, the chief of the Indian Army did actually not only say this is acceptable, but he gave the fellow who did it an award. Um, this was April 2017. He gave him the Chief of the Army Staff Commendation Card for Sustained Efforts in Counterinsurgency Operations. So the current situation is that the peak here was for violence was 2001. There were about 4,500 people killed. So civilians military, paramilitary, and also terrorists. 2018, there were only 450 people killed. So it's 10% of what it was in 2001. Uh, but it has been increasing again since 2012. Um, and last year, the Indian military killed about 270 militants. They think there's still about 250 militants. But part of the problem is it's not just militants infiltrating across the line of control, which is done by Pakistan and India engaging in small arms fire or artillery exchanges and people, uh, while they're distracted, crossing the border somewhere else. But it's also younger Kashmiris now joining the militancy. The militancy's moved from the north to also include the south of Kashmir. It's moved from urban areas also to include rural areas. It's moved from lesser educated to include highly educated Kashmiris, and now particularly young people. There's young people 15, 16, 17 joining the insurgency, and that's a real problem for India, and it's probably going to go on. It's also important because China is involved. 1962, India and, Pakistan, uh, India and China fought a war, which China won conclusively, and China is still involved in those two areas that I showed you earlier. It holds territory that India claims, uh, Pakistan and China happen to be all-weather friends, closer than teeth and gums. I don't know anything closer than teeth and gums. It's a little bit spurious, that claim, because China did not help Pakistan militarily when it fought India in 1971, uh, as a result of which Bangladesh came into being. It did not help them during the Kargil conflict either. So it's not unequivocal. It also is concerned about Pakistani support for Uyghur separatists and various other folk in the west of China. Um, but importantly, CPEC is going through that area of Jammu and Kashmir. So China's a little concerned because India says, this is our area. You're going through disputed territory. So there's a little bit of concern. But the line of actual control is what they call the, the working boundary between China and India is fairly friendly. And I did have a photo up there of a skirmish, a physical scuffle between Indians and Chinese in about 2014, 13, sorry, but it's disappeared. So somehow or another, China has got to my PowerPoint presentation and manipulated it. So I don't know how that happened, so apologies for that. But China is also involved, and that's significant. Um, 
So India and China have this very complex relationship. They have a trade relationship of 80 billion, and on the other extreme, they have a territorial and border dispute, and in between, uh, lots of other things going on. But China does have to worry about if there is a war with Pakistan, do we have to be concerned about fighting a two-front war? Part of their doctrine includes planning for a two-front war. Very difficult to do, but the Indians believe they can do it. It's also important because it shows the ineffectiveness of the United Nations, particularly the Security Council. The UN Security Council passed various resolutions that said there should be a plebiscite. They tried to institute the plebiscite and it hasn't happened. And since 1965, it has not been looked at by the Security Council. In fact, it's been taken off the register of unresolved disputes and Pakistan now annually has to say to the Security Council, we want the Kashmir dispute kept up on that register. Um, there is an UNMAGIP, United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan, very popular on the Pakistan side. India chooses to ignore it to some extent on the Indian side, but it's still there. It comprises about 60 people who monitor cross line of control issues. Uh, the Security Council hasn't looked at it for a long period of time. Now what happens is that the United Nations has become a forum, really, where senior Indians and Pakistanis berate each other about Kashmir and say, you know, you're doing the wrong thing or so on and so forth. On the left, the current Indian Foreign Minister, Mr Qureshi, uh, the Indian Foreign Minister, Sushma Swaraj, and the fellow on the right is actually the former Pakistan Prime Minister, Mr Abbasi. So the UN has proven to be ineffectual. It's also important because the people in the Kashmir Valley, yeah. Yes? Uh, it depends on, on what's raised. It used to be the Soviet Union, actually. They used to veto it when India, uh, because they were so close to, to India, whenever it came up, the Soviet Union would veto it for India. Uh, that's, it is really to do with the veto power. And, but also the Security Council has just lost interest. They, try, they sent various, they sent at least three representatives to try and institute, have the plebiscite held, uh, no luck. And I think they just realised that it's intractable. We can't resolve it. And since similar also, the similar agreement between India and Pakistan in 1971, where India said everything will be bilateral, I think the UN thought, well, we've now also been cast out of the, the game as well. So it's for all of those reasons, particularly India's reluctance. It also encourages these Islamists. So folk who are hardline Muslims say that it's Hindu India. And to some extent, India is moving to become not Hindu, but Hindu elements have become more powerful. That's a fairly recent development. They've been talking about Hindu India for a long period of time. And there are some who desire not only to see the end of Hindu India, but to see all of South Asia become part of the Ummah, the, uh, the Islamic community. Um, and it motivates groups like Lashka e Toiba and Jayashi Muhammad. Now, Lashka e Toiba is a very interesting body because it only operates outside Pakistan, which is why the Pakistanis tolerate it. Jayashi Muhammad also largely operates outside Pakistan, but they're proxies that Pakistan uses to cause problems in Jammu and Kashmir. So they are, those folk are motivated by protecting Muslims and reunifying Muslims. You all know this term irredentism. Irredentism, um, claiming areas that either used to be part of your nation or should be part of your nation because they're similar ethnicities, religions, culture, and so on. So the Pakistanis say, these are Muslims. They should be part of Pakistan, the nation set up for Muslims in 1947. India says, no, this, we are a secular nation. There's a place for everybody within India. India has 29 states, not all of them are actually dominated by Hindus. There are five states where there are other religions who have majority populations. And uh, Kashmir is one of them. It's a Muslim majority population within secular India. There's a place for everybody. So it's, a, it's part of the reason why this dispute continues also is because of that clash of the ideologies. Should a state be set up for a religion only or is, is secularism the way to go? And arguably, uh, because Pakistan's had some serious problems trying to determine which type of Islam it wants, it would be better if it was secular. But it, it certainly imply, uh, inspires some. Now, these photos are interesting because you have to be very careful what you see. You, you know about false news, fake news, so on and so forth. So 
I don't know if these pictures have been doctored or not, but this one where it says independent Kashmir, it's quite interesting because the flag in the background is actually the flag of Azad Kashmir, which is one of the areas that Pakistan administers, which is very pro-Pakistan. This one down the bottom where it says Indian brutalities, well, you'll see there the guy is a Sikh. Now, there is a small Sikh population within India, uh, within Jammu and Kashmir as well, but it hasn't been brutalised to the same extent. It's just uh, a little bit quirky. But one thing the Pakistanis don't understand is that the Kashmiri nationalism is more important than either India or Pakistan, or indeed Islam. Kashmiris are Kashmiris first, then Muslims. They're not Muslims first, then Kashmiris. So their identity is really important, and that's the challenge for India, to recognise and manage and accommodate that identity within Pakistan. The conflict's also important because it really is holding India back. Yes, it's affordable, and it's arguably more affordable because the Indian economy is growing at about 7.5%. But if you want to be a great power, you really want to have settled borders. And this is one of the strengths of the United States. Canada in the north, Mexico on the south, you don't have in, you have minor disputes with Canada, I think. But they're pretty minor. Not, you're not going to war over them. This is a serious shortcoming for India. And I think it also keeps India's focus on land warfare, not maritime activities. They are expanding in terms of their maritime capabilities, but they've got a long way to go. And the, I've got China and Russia up there because China now has this settled border with Russia in the north. So during the Cold War, when uh, the Soviet Union and China weren't getting on, this was a real shortcoming for China. Now China doesn't have to worry about Russia in the north. So settled borders are something that's very useful India does not then yet have it. And does this then lessen its ability to help US? Now, you don't have an alliance, but you certainly have a strategic partnership. And I think the US would like India to do certain things. Well, India can and it can't. It can do certain things, but it can't while ever it's got this ball and chain of Jammu and Kashmir dragging behind it. So there's seven reasons why it's significant. Um, is it going to be resolved soon? No. Is it going to be resolved in my lifetime? Depends how long I live, uh, but probably not. So there's no good news about Jammu and Kashmir. India and Pakistan get along quite well without resolving this dispute. It creates opportunities for Pakistan to meddle. It creates challenges for India. But India doesn't want to let it go because it doesn't want to give it to Pakistan. Independence is not an option. So I don't think much is going to happen. So there we are. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Uh, <coughs> yeah, I have a question, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Prashant Shirvasav. I'm from India. And uh, as much as I would like to speak to you about cricket, but I think the time <laughs> does not permit me to talk anything more than Kashmir. A uh, few things that, one couple of them are comments and one is a quick question. Firstly, about plebiscite, you, when, you, when you mentioned about the third party and why third party not there, because plebiscite is not doable, I'm sure uh, in your eminent study you would have uh, been able to establish that there has been a significant demographic change on both the uh, Indian side of the Kashmir and the Pakistan occupied side of the Kashmir. Uh, for the simple reason that Pakistan has settled its uh, ex-soldiers onto the so-called Azad Kashmir, and uh, there has been one of the greatest misreport unreported misery uh, on the Indian side, wherein about 700,000 Hindus and Sikhs have been, uh, have, been, have been moved out forcibly under uh, uh, various kind of pressures out of the Kashmir Valley. So plebiscite is not really, in my view, is something not right. Second is about the nuclear war. It's a bogey which has been uh, repeatedly generated by Pakistan just to keep the international, international community interested in Kashmir. Uh, because uh, I'm sure, sir, you're well aware that uh, India's nuclear doctrine talks of no first use mm -hmm. of nuclear weapon, and Pakistan has no such doctrine. It talks about, nucle it talks about nuclear weapon as the first uh, weapon of uh, war. Yeah. Uh, so far as the trust deficit is concerned, uh, it, it's quite evident mm -hmm. that uh, I'd rather not go back into the history. The, one of the things that you mentioned, that in 1988, is a time when the uprising started. If you were to just tally this uh, date with the date when the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan began, and what Pakistan could, uh, what were the options with Pakistan uh, to utilize the so-called Mujahideens 
uh, which it had trained and nurtured for the la for about a decade mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. So that's what they, 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 this was the best option. Otherwise, they would have turned back on them. So far as Siachen is concerned, I'm glad you brought out the importance. It, it's, it's not just a strategic importance, it's a geopolitical importance, because Siachen is something which comes right in between the uh, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan and China, uh, uh, joining together right on top. So that, that's one thing. Now, so far the human rights is concerned, uh, the, the photographs, which were, I wish you had shown some of the photographs. Uh, they, 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 they kind of, they are selective representation of uh, human right violation. Uh, for every one photograph of pellet injuries where an individual has lived, I can perhaps, uh, I'm sure that they're, they're on media, uh, there, are, there are plenty of photographs of Indian soldiers being skinned alive. And I have, uh, I have spent a fair amount of time in Kashmir. Uh, and lastly, sir, uh, my question, now these were all observations. My question is that uh, your presentation was very erudite, no doubt about that. But I wish uh, there was some narrative from Azad Kashmir, so the, the, the so-called Azad Kashmir side. The audience need to know that what is the status of uh, the people living on uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. They, uh, uh, there are credible reports that what is the, what is the kind of uh, the, the standard of living, the social indicators on that side, where it on this side. What is the uh, insurrection which has taking place in Baltistan and Gilgistan, mm -hmm. Gil uh, Gilgit, which are primarily Shia-dominated areas, plus in the uh, Mirpur side, uh, which, were, which sided with Pakistan at one point in time. So I would like to hear a narrative, though I know uh, that we are almost out of time. Uh, of w what's happening on that side? Because everything you've spoken of is happening on east of the line of control. Yeah, look, there's, there's very little happening on the other side. Uh, let me just go forward to this one. Uh, I do actually mention Balwaristan. These are the, the aspirations of the various people of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, when you talk about Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, it's a difficult term because it can mean the two areas that Pakistan administers, or you can use it selectively to refer to either Azad Kashmir or Gilgit Baltistan. I'm going to... There's... Two areas. So Azad Kashmir has its own parliament, uh, but it's very much under the control of Pakistan. Same with Gilgit Baltistan. They have their own legislature, very much under the control of Pakistan. Uh, one of the things that's changed in Gilgit Baltistan is that there, you don't have to be a state subject to buy land now, which has allowed Pakistan to move in a lot of Sunnis, which has created an ethnic and religious issue between, as you correctly say, the Shias who are most of the native population and these immigrants. That's a real problem. One of the results of which is this Balwaristan. They want an independent area in the north of um, Jammu and Kashmir. Azad Kashmir, it's very similar to the Kashmir Valley. They have very high levels of education uh, in terms of their, their well-being and their standard of living, pretty much similar to Jammu and Kashmir. They have one advantage over Jammu and Kashmir. It's much easier for them to get to the plains of Pakistan and get whatever they need. So their connections are a lot easier. It's very difficult in the, if you're in the Kashmir Valley because you're now dependent on going down through one road that goes down through Jammu, which is subjected to snowfalls and also landslides, both of which are occurring at the moment, and that road is closed. Um, on, on both sides, Pakistan really has them very much under the, their control. There is freedom of speech. They do have elections and so on and so forth. The Mirpur area is interesting because there are these so-called Pakistanis in England, many of whom actually come from Mirpur, and they're, they're not actually Pakistanis, they're Azad Kashmiris. And there's a very significant dam in Azad Kashmir called the Mangla Dam, which stores a lot of water for Pakistan irrigation and also produces a lot of hydroelectricity. Um, it, but it is within Azad Kashmir. So that's one of the ways they now finally, since about 2004, get revenue for both storing that water and also hydroelectricity generation. But most of the people there, as far as I can work out, are fairly pro-Pakistan. All right, I've got to shut it off here. We've got yep. other uh, regional studies that are going to come into this room here. Okay, all right. Well, thank <laughs> all right. you all very much.